Can I start? Okay. Well, hello everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. It's a pleasure to welcome Federico Bellentani from the University of Turin in Italy. And he also teaches urban design at the University of Bologna and digital marketing at the University of Ferrara. Okay. He has three books published and from his books edited book, Semiotic Approaches to Urban Space, he will provide suggestions for his talk. His talk will be about the global population that is moving every time more into big cities. Urban life has to be reshaped and technology has to be managed to integrate meanings and interpretations of city dwellers. A human approach is needed. The presenter will focus on studying cities as semiotics entities. The format of this webinar is about, Belantani will have about 40 to 45 minutes to speak. And after that, I will call uh, all the panelists and we're uh, many of them, and they will have about five minutes to make their comments and remarks. And, and when they finish, then Belantani wraps up and answers all the questions made. Okay, so welcome Belantani to our talk. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. I'm going to share my screen for the presentation. I hope you see it. If there's any issue, please, please tell me. I think it's going to load now. Okay. I really would like to thank all the team uh, at the uh, uh, Smart Semiotics uh, webinar series, uh, as well as Professor Paul Boussac for this opportunity to present uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, my research in uh, uh, such a great uh, panel with uh, uh, great uh, uh, professors and scholars, uh, which will definitely help me to, uh, to improve my research. Uh, as you said, I'm Federico Belentani, I'm postdoc researcher and project manager in a new European project that uh, with the Professor Massimo Leone as a principal investigator at the University of Turin. And uh, I'm also a consultant, uh, head of marketing and communication at an uh, ECT company based in Bologna, where I live with uh, uh, my family with a strong background in semiotic and storytelling. So today, that's why I would like to, uh, on the research side, my uh, main uh, mm, uh, topic is uh, uh, mm, drafted in uh, uh, urban semiotic and the semiotics of the, of the city. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I also, uh, in my um, commercial work, uh, deal with uh, uh, technology and innovation project, and I deal also with uh, uh, several smart city projects uh, uh, with, uh, with clients and the public administration in, in Italy. So today I'm going to present uh, a few preliminary ideas of how to integrate technology in smart uh, city project and a semiotic approach to deal with that. Uh, there is nothing the definitive in, uh, in my talk, especially because I would like to take this opportunity to really discuss with you. So my talk is going to be uh, really uh, some preliminary ideas uh, uh, on uh, um, how to look at the relationship between technology, city and people, basically. Uh, and obviously, I'm going to have an overview of uh, uh, the semiotic of the city, where we can find uh, the theoretical and methodological uh, um, frameworks which can help us to do so. So in the next 40-45 uh, minutes, I'm going to look at the context of the smart city, then to look at the research uh, uh, of semiotics on uh, uh, the city and urban space, uh, uh, to then go toward a semiotic approach to technology and smart city, and then uh, to pose some questions for uh, uh, future research and for the later uh, discussion. Um, so let's start from uh, uh, the very basics, also you know, the interpretation of uh, the, the smart city. Smart city is a concept that is there since uh, 
uh, already about uh, 20 years, let's say, and then it is always used at different levels, from the academy to the public discourse, uh, to the institution and to the legal level. And there has been an ongoing discussion in these domains, uh, and the term is often used ambiguously. So we uh, can find it with very different uh, meaning across uh, different times, uh, uh, institutional cultures, and so on and so forth. Uh, for sure, um, there are some uh, uh, common characteristics uh, among uh, the various definitions of smart city. Uh, the uh, technology is always at the core of this, uh, uh, of this concept. So the emphasis of uh, smart city is placely, uh, um, solely and exclusively on the technological aspect, uh, which is... Uh, a common trend of putting smart uh, in, in front of another concept in order to say, okay, let's digitalize it, let's put some technology on it. So smart city, at the same way, uh, are a city that with the help of the technology, um, with the technology embedded in their own urban space. Uh, until the uh, concept take even uh, uh, um, different approaches that looks even to the future or futuri uh, futuristic venture into the realm of, of science fiction. So there is also the, the narrative of, uh, of the city of the future, uh, highly technological, uh, uh, which is also represented in some uh, more or less dystopical science uh, uh, fiction uh, text uh, which can be on on the literature as well on uh, um, on uh, on other media movies uh, cinema uh, tv series and so on and so forth uh, just to give an idea of what we are talking about uh, in practice so beyond uh, the main narratives that we can find in the public discourse especially uh, there are several areas uh, of uh, um, smart city project at the institutional level that goes uh, from the uh, uh, sustainable mobility, so to make uh, the traffic uh, uh, more efficient, uh, uh, to make the public transport more efficient, uh, to do some, uh, the, to make the parking in cities more uh, efficient until um, uh, micro mobility and uh, a car sharing mobility project uh, across uh, uh, cities. Uh, there is some uh, smart environment um, uh, thread where we do have uh, the monitoring of uh, pollution and quality sensor on the soils on the irrigation system, uh, detection of wildlife and, and so on and so forth. Um, energy efficiency, so smart buildings, smart grid are some of the main uh, uh, projects uh, um, undertaken all over the world uh, where uh, the, the idea is to make uh, uh, more efficient indeed in terms of energy and resources, uh, uh, in terms of utility, multi-utility and so on and so forth uh, in, in the city. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, regarding energy, water, all the supplies uh, within the city. Until smart government, and here we come uh, more into the communication between uh, government, uh, uh, city government and, uh, and the citizens. Uh, so to have the transparency of public administration, to have online voting and to have some uh, projects to engage uh, more closely with the citizens. Uh, smart health, uh, uh, that deals especially with the uh, public health and the hospital, uh, with the order recording, uh, up until security and uh, uh, smart tourism and entertainment. So there are different, this is not exhaustive, of course, as a, as a list. Uh, those are names uh, that are differently used uh, in different uh, uh, government practices all over the world. But just, just to give an idea beyond, uh, you know, the uh, concept, uh, the, the common concept that traditionally used in the, uh, in the media with solely focus on, you know, uh, uh, a general idea of embedding technology on, on the city. Uh, let's come more closely to 
uh, what is uh, uh, the smart city for uh, the European Union? Uh, yeah. Because it's interesting to look at uh, how uh, European Union define it. Um, a smart city is a place where traditional network and services are made more efficient with the use of digital solutions for the benefits of its inhabitants. Smart city goes beyond the use of digital technology for better resource utilization and lower emission. It means smart and urban transport network, improved by water supplies, and all the things that we see already before. It also means a more interactive and responsive city administration, safer public spaces, and better meeting the need uh, and better meeting the need of an aging population. So here it's interesting because the main narrative uh, is uh, toward the progress and uh, to make a better life uh, for the citizens. So the focus is always uh, on the inhabitants and all, all, all the citizens. So we do, we use technology and we do smart city project in order to make uh, uh, our resident uh, uh, a, a, a easier life, uh, to make a better life uh, within, uh, within the city. And we will see uh, a bit later how this is not necessarily always met by... Yeah, I see, I hear some... Um, is there anything wrong or can I go on? I hear something. Okay, so I think I can go on. Um, and we'll see how this narrative of uh, the, the improvement uh, to Smart City Project uh, uh, is not necessarily met uh, in in practice. So as we see, you know, the uh, as I said, the, the aims of smart cities you know, to manage resources intelligently, to become economically sustainable and uh, energy self-sufficient, to improve the quality of life for its citizens uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, uh, there is the need to, um, uh, to rethink also and uh, and to make some critics toward this uh, idea. Of course, uh, smart cities uh, uh, provide a great benefit uh, for, uh, for the businesses, uh, provide uh, great funds for public administration, provide uh, a venue uh, to test some technological advancement. But on the other hand, improving citizens' lives uh, often remain a, a slogan that is not always pushed in practice. So this is why uh, I think a more qualitative and humanistic approach to uh, smart city, and that's why we're here, uh, we can actually uh, take into the, the, the discussion, uh, maybe um, uh, interesting to pursue in order to uh, um, uh, to, to, to solve this uh, this lack not solve 100 percent but you know to, to contribute toward uh, the resolution of uh, uh, this issue and what they say regarding the uh, you know how uh, improving citizen life became often remain a slogan uh, is also seen uh, uh, in uh, in the perception that uh, uh, smart city project has when they are tested later uh, and uh, uh, assessed uh, through survey or uh, interviews and so on and so forth i have uh, um, a source from an italian uh, organization as well as from the World Economic Forum, from where we see that uh, uh, smart city remain uh, something that is uh, basically discussed at uh, uh, governmental or public discourse level, but uh, that in real life uh, is uh, even difficult to be perceived as something that uh, uh, ameliorate the the uh, the life of the citizens. So uh, the perception we see from the source Intel that one in two Italians does not know what a smart city is, for example, and only 13% of citizens believe that they live in a very smart city. 
uh, on the contrary, 37% uh, of citizens would like to leave their city and 27% intend to relocate. When we go to a larger scale on the World Economic Forum, we see that only 17% of cities assess the impact of privacy before implementing new technology. So we see also that there's an issue you know, in, uh, uh, in relation to uh, actually start from the basic of uh, uh, embedded technology to, uh, to the city from the, 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 the very issue of, of the privacy. And less than 50% of the Pioneer City, which is a group of city which pioneered indeed some smart uh, project, uh, uh, a, a smart city project, uh, use the procedure to ensure that technology are accessible to elderly citizens or people with physical limitations. So we see that smart cities are only for uh, a, a, a part of, of the population and uh, fail to to do what they often uh, claim uh, to do uh, to make uh, the city uh, more uh, more um, democratic, uh, to make uh, urban space more accessible and to everyone and so on and so forth. And only 50% of cities have integrated their open data portal. Where the open data portal is uh, uh, at the base of Smart City Project, uh, the institution uh, uh, make a portal transparent to the population where all the data uh, of, uh, of their work, of their uh, institution are, are placed. Uh, this is important because uh, um, there's often you know, some claims to do some smart city project, but that there are no data to, uh, to do that, or the data are um, in many different places, or the data are not in the format uh, that they're needed, or the data cannot be visualized uh, in a way that uh, the citizens, uh, businesses, uh, transportation organizations, so on and so forth, can use it, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, another uh, limitation. Where are uh, the failing points of this issue that I'm discussing with you uh, today? Well, uh, in in, in uh, from what I see from my commercial work, from some uh, uh, preliminary desk uh, work, uh, is that uh, mm, they mainly focus on uh, on technology. So, uh, as we see in the first slide, uh, a smart city project is a uh, it means to embed technology uh, into uh, into the city and city life. So we need to start from there. No? So let's do something with artificial intelligence. Let's do something with machine learning. Let's do something with cloud. Let's see some, something with IoT or Beacon and so on and so forth. It's not like uh, there is an actual issue that I studied uh, throughout and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and then I do add the technology, which is a bit of machine learning, a bit of cloud, a bit of IoT, a bit of Beacon, I don't know, whatever, to uh, solve this issue. Rather, they start from technology and then go to uh, to the solution. At the same time, in this way, there's no need, you know, to ask the citizens, which would be, in my opinion, the first things to do, right? So there's no the uh, participatory planning uh, uh, method used, uh, uh, not always, at least, right? And there is a lack of a massive city involvement uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, would make the city, um, the smart city project uh, successful and also accepted and, and approved by the citizen. And there is a difficult public private relationship. I was saying it before with the data, right? So if you want to do some smart transport project, uh, uh, fantastic. But if the trans public transport uh, uh, organization, there's also some private uh, uh, companies on it which does not share the data will be difficult for the, the city government to do it and so on and so forth. Um, and all these, um, it seems now that the technological development uh, is linked, you know, to to make life of the city better, and uh, is linked to the real needs of people. For instance, we know that uh, it is not like that, and and at least until the technology is designed. Uh, so a more humanistic and qualitative approach uh, to actually meet the needs of the people. <clears throat> so what to do? I'm calling for this new approach. 
right? Uh, we we need uh, uh, at least uh, we we are in a uh, in an historical time where uh, um, there is the possibility to uh, to see the failing point uh, after at least twenty years uh, more of. Uh, uh, of smart city projects, a preliminary smart city project, to see what are the main failing points and to provide a solution which is not only based on the technological progress and advancement. Uh, and one uh, approach that focus on the individual, social and cultural context of the citizens and how they interpret the, the smart city project and open space in general. I would say a semiotic one. Uh, in in this respect, uh, as uh, as we see from uh, uh, how people interpret smart city projects, uh, how are they meaning making process, uh, uh, but of course it's not only limited uh, to it. So uh, to call it for uh, an interdisciplinary approach to do that. So if uh, we are going to uh, provide uh, this, we definitely need to look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the semiotics and the city. So if we need an approach uh, uh, which look at the meaning making and the interpretation of the city, we know that we are going to place ourselves uh, within uh, a, a huge tradition uh, of uh, uh, semiotician and scholar which use semiotics uh, uh, to look at the meaning making and the interpretation of the city beyond the only uh, economical social uh, uh, aspect of it and in this respect uh, uh, we know that uh, this tradition uh, started if we want to uh, make a starting point with architectural semiotics since the 70s that has sought to develop a framework for understanding how architecture convey meanings with some uh, founding father of, uh, of semiotic, from Bart to, to Eco, from Lotten to Gremas, and so on and so forth. Umberto Eco especially uh, proposed viewing ar architecture as a, a system of sign comprising spatial, denotative, and connotative elements. So while architecture objects serve functional purpose, they also communicate through their form and function. And from here, they started the uh, uh, subsequent scholarship that advanced this exploration, uh, doing uh, several semiotic analysis of uh, architecture. I remember uh, especially the uh, the work uh, the, of uh, the um, International Association of Semiotic of Space and Time. Here we have also Claudio Guerri among the discuss and the work of uh, uh, Pier Pellegrino uh, and so on and so forth. From here we go to urban semiotics uh, was uh, uh, Professor Lagulopoulos which redefined eco-semiotic theory of architecture and broadened the discussion uh, to include uh, uh, a larger uh, view on urban space proposing an urban social semiotics uh, to explore collective process in city planning uh, to develop uh, a cohesive model for future cities so to look at the plans uh, to see how the model of uh, the future model of the city will be like uh, once uh, 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 indeed the plan and design the world of urban semiotics uh, uh, already was uh, uh, there Ever since the 80s, since the work of Gottinger and Lagulopoulos, uh, which pioneered the field of urban semiotics. Uh, and here, the uh, several uh, uh, contributions and articles in this uh, uh, book, uh, in, in general, uh, aim to delineate the criteria that define urban space uh, in both pre capitalist and contemporary cities. And uh, from here, uh, once again, uh, started a sort of tradition. Uh, uh, to or the semiotic analysis of urban spaces and their representation. In Italy especially, this was uh, uh, a strong call since uh, uh, the 2000, from 2005 on. Uh, there has been, uh, even at the University of Bologna, University of San Marino, several conferences of uh, Italian semioticians looking at uh, uh, the semiotics uh, 
of the city, um, as well as, again, the work of uh, Pierre uh, Pellegrino and uh, uh, other uh, traditionals in the Tartu Moscow School and uh, uh, the work uh, of sanitation and Estonians uh, to make some examples. Uh, from here, there's also then, uh, uh, there's not only, the, you know, from architecture to urban space, uh, when there is a larger uh, um, object of study, that there is also um, a, 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 a smaller uh, object of study, and this is the, the, the built environment. Uh, there has been... Uh, wars on the semiotics of the built environment, uh, rationally its physicality, its materiality, and uh, that see the built environment as a discourse, that has an author uh, which can draft or at least entice users uh, along uh, several, uh, in, uh, along specific interpretation uh, uh, in order to influence community of interpreters. And we know, of course, that. Uh, urban communities differently interpret uh, uh, the discourse of the author uh, crafted through the built environment, especially some mutation has focus on uh, infrastructure after for political, social, and cultural reason, meaning uh, buildings, uh, squares, uh, monuments, memorials, uh, museum, national landscape design, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, somehow going beyond all the rest of uh, the built environments, which more, uh, which we can uh, generally define as a more functional uh, uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> we give here a tentative uh, taxonomy of what uh, the semiotic uh, of the city has uh, produced so far. Uh, on, uh, uh, and we can see five uh, streams uh, of, uh, uh, in, within this uh, brief uh, overview that uh, I presented today. The semiological paradigm rooted in the war look at uh, the urban space as the same system made of values and meaning and uh, uh, that draws parallels with text and language. The general model by the Paris School and, and Gremas uh, uh, that look at urban text as evolving through uh, different levels of signification from the abstract, from the more abstract to the uh, more concrete, uh, and it examines these layers beyond the textual realm. The Tartu Moscow School that revises this textual paradigm, providing a more pragmatic understanding of urban space, uh, the city was really at the core of the Tartu Moscow School since the very beginning, since the work of Ivanov that look at the city as a model of universal space and later Lotman, which placed the city within the symbolic system of culture. Uh, an interpretative approach uh, drawing from Charles Peirce's model of uh, semiotics, which was employed also to explore uh, the social memory uh, of uh, uh, the city, uh, delving into uh, our various memorials and urban structure from the past, along with the cultural invention in the present, interact with contemporary urban space. This model was also used and revised uh, by we have here, you know, Claudio Guerri indeed, which uh, definitely um, we can discuss about uh, uh, this part later. Until uh, an emerging uh, trend in biosemiotics, which views the biological and physical process as same system within uh, within the city, with uh, um, a specific uh, and vertical analysis of, uh, for example, urban wildlife, uh, as well as uh, uh, um, uh, think and rethink uh, the category of nature culture and how this is used in. Uh, in the city. I wanted to tell that for me is needed to do a certain kind of schematization of uh, this huge tradition of semiotics that look at uh, architecture and then urban space and built environment and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean for me uh, to, to be exhaustive, of course, in this uh, overview. And in general, the taxonomy, of course, is a taxonomy. So uh, there are, of course, some, some scholars which can move uh, between, for example, 
uh, uh, the same logical part in an interpretative one that are from Moscow School in the biosemiotics and so on and so forth. Uh, but just to be, uh, of course, uh, uh, fair, uh, this taxonomy was developed in uh, uh, a new book, which not only he, I did write, but also uh, Mario Panico um, at the University of Amsterdam and Lian Lioca at the University of Saloniki, uh, with Bright, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, in, is the semiotic approach to uh, to urban space, uh, and the editor is giving a, a discount offer for uh, in uh, um, occasion of uh, of this webinar. Small um, advertisement. We know that we don't need really to. Uh, uh, it's only for the sake of saying that uh, this book was done not only by me but also by uh, some other people. Me, Mario Panico, and uh, Lia Young. All these bring me to uh, the model which uh, I developed uh, looking at the semiotic of monuments and memorials specifically, but we can be extended on the built environment and urban space. Uh, if we want to look at uh, a more humanistic approach uh, to the city and then to the relationship that the city has with the technology, uh, then I mm, make this model and this scheme uh, which is very simple, but that allow me to uh, uh, highlight uh, some uh, very um, uh, some uh, semiotic and important uh, uh, points, uh, which uh, I will need to to indeed uh, uh, discuss this issue. So we have, of course, the world of culture, city, stay within. The world of culture, cities are made of a built environment, which are made of a built form, and city built environment and built forms are always uh, placed on the interplay between uh, the intention of the designer that planned them uh, in order to convey specific meaning and how those meanings are interpreted throughout time uh, among the culture and so on and so forth by their actual user in this kind of interplay which uh, uh, was developed already by Umberto Eco on uh, uh, looking at the interpretation of text and, and can that can be applied uh, to the interpretation of the cities and its environment specifically. Uh, Bill forms, of course, has a plastic figurative uh, dimension, but it's also a culture and political dimension, which needs to be taken into account when uh, in city planning, specifically in smart uh, uh, city uh, uh, projects. So that's uh, uh, to uh, to summarize uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, how I look at uh, uh, cities and how I look at the, uh, their built environment and how this can be uh, exploited into a smart city project. Let's come back then uh, to this topic. Uh, to try to create some first bridges between semiotics, technology, and the city. We see already at the issue, what are smart city today? Smart city today are projects made uh, by city institution, uh, which uh, focus solely and start with the technology, and also with some companies which provide this technology, of course. Technology is then often imposed and is driven by trends. Nowadays, there are the generative uh, AI trends. So, okay, let's do something with that. You know, before was the machine learning, even before it was uh, the cloud and so on and so forth. And it always goes uh, to, to the trends, following the trends. Uh, there is the idea that the more smart means uh, more technology. And uh, there is... Uh, an excessive focus on the commercial exploitation of this project. So uh, a number of uh, companies, which can be also private one, which have interest in uh, looking at uh, uh, the uh, smart city projects. Uh, notably also an excessive focus on uh, security, surveillance and monitoring, especially um, in uh, uh, not democratic countries. Uh, these are uh, projects that have been uh, very much uh, uh, 
promoted uh, and uh, but also in our democracy nowadays uh, uh, cities are uh, much more monitored controls or surveilled through uh, face technology and uh, other technology of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, for all these often the uh, smart city remains uh, ideas uh, on paper they actually don't act uh, are not realized in the uh, in uh, in practice uh, some of them are actually realized uh, Songdo in uh, South Korea or uh, Mazda City in the United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, those uh, are typical cases of uh, smart cities, of not making the city that already exists smart, of making out of scratch new cities that are actual smart cities, uh, full of technology with a specific kind of architecture, a specific kind of uh, um, as um, practices uh, that are uh, uh, designed uh, for for this city, but in the end of the day, they actually don't uh, have any uh, kind of success, and they uh, remain uh, a sort of a point of failure of uh, uh, of the project. Uh, this is for, for example, for the high living cost, but especially. Or a lack of cultural and social attraction that uh, the city has, a top-down approach to planning that ignore, as we see before, the necessity for organic growth and natural occurring cities, and the future uh, plan that often lack the practicality. So again, the focus is on, I don't know, showcasing futuristic concepts rather than meeting the real needs of inhabitants. The focus is on technology rather than meeting the real needs of inhabitants and so on and so forth. So there are also cases in the world of cities, uh, of smart cities designed out of scratch uh, that um, failed exactly for the reason uh, that there is a top-down approach, focus on technology, focus on uh, how uh, it's supposedly to be futuristic and beautiful a city, but then that in practice doesn't actually work. So, and here I come toward the, uh, the, 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 the contribution, uh, the first preliminary contribution of my talk and some ideas for the discussion. The main goal that, of the smart city of today and tomorrow, so to, of a revised concept of smart city, it should be to actually improve the quality of life for the citizen and to make the work of the administration, of administration easier. So it's this uh, kind of double objective, of course, the focus on the citizens, but also to make the work of administration easier toward the use of technology. And for this reason, you should focus on the user interpretation, both citizens and public administration as the citizens. You should consider the political, social, and cultural meaning of the places where the smart projects actually embed, actually goes, and actually are realized uh, within the city. Uh, and uh, I call for smart city project that starts uh, with the, in this respect to the human intelligence who uh, a real uh, knowledge of the cognitive uh, uh, um, aspect of what that part of the city is, that city is, that community is, uh, and start with the human intelligence and personal memory rather than starting from artificial intelligence and database. And it then puts technology at the service of people's existential needs, not the other way around. No one here is against technology or against uh, the progress of the technology, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I call for a uh, um, design and a technological uh, development which look at the, uh, the people first. The technology is the reason. The reason why there is technology is digital technologies, especially in this respect. I'm looking at uh, digital technology is uh, uh, because the, the human created it and uh, it should develop on the horizon of our needs rather than uh, the other way around. If we, uh, if the, the public administration say, I would like to do a smart city project, uh, uh, so let's start with artificial intelligence. So for example, starting only with the focus on the technology, then 
uh, this um, uh, we have a, a black box which uh, prevent the smart city project to actually be effective and successful uh, also for uh, the the the, uh, the work of the public administration uh, at various level um, from from the economic to to the social and cultural one so we need also this a new idea of uh, of smart of uh, as, I, as i said already before humanistic and qualitative approach that can analyze the interpretation of urban space and technology as well so to adapt to the needs of people taking account the cultural context in which technology and smart uh, project smart city project uh, are embedded the objective is not then technical rather it is I would say semiotics, aiming to analyze how technology acquire meaning with, uh, within culture of a multifaceted community, the citizens, both on digital platform and uh, offline. And this is a, um, a source on a research of, of a few years ago, so it's really a bit um, uh, old, but uh, it's analytics and organization doing for city projects uh, through internet of things and so on and so forth uh, you see at the second point already you know uh, there was an idea so also the, the organization the research institution push for the citizen count first mindset uh, and aligning the, uh, these uh, um, uh, smart city projects uh, uh, to to the real life of citizens so it's not only you know uh, uh, um, the ideas of a semiotician coming uh, uh, out of nowhere but uh, a, a real need uh, um, uh, uh, recognized by uh, by many. Um, at the vertical level, there can be many different projects uh, which uh, has to do with smart city, but also a very vertical idea. For example, I'm project manager of this uh, EU facets, a principal investigator is uh, Professor Massimo Leone, which aims uh, exactly to develop a technology for uh, elderly people which uh, lives uh, in uh, uh, elderly houses in uh, in the city to develop an app to connect uh, uh, their uh, them and their personal memories from the past and uh, from from the present uh, with their uh, uh, large uh, uh, family including the caregiver and to give the caregiver a, a digital tool, an app, uh, in order to uh, structure uh, this kind of communication between the elderly at the elderly house and their extended family in order not to be this uh, uh, messy or not done or done through WhatsApp and so on and so forth. So in this respect is a, a very vertical uh, uh, project and uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, which is, um, make the city smart in terms uh, that uh, uh, we, we focus on uh, elderly houses which uh, stay in, in a city. But this is not uh, beside the project itself. Uh, what is important here is, is that there is a team of uh, semiotician, anthropologists, uh, social scientists that first look at the real uh, needs of uh, the elderly and their families and their caregiver through workshop, uh, uh, humanistic methodology, um, research uh, on, on desk also, of course, on, uh, to look at the various papers written on uh, the relationship between um, health and technology and so on and so forth, and then develop through uh, uh, companies um, um, a technology which there um, start from a concept which is really uh, humanistic but proven also on the, on the field so indeed was it uh, as I was saying workshop and so on and so forth so is uh, somehow a little bit the other way around of uh, the issue that I see on uh, on the uh, smart city project to say okay this is a solution then we test it rather than let's test and then we design the technology in order to be uh, more um, tailored to uh, the need of, uh, uh, of the users. So, as I said, uh, no conclusion from my side. Some first preliminary ideas uh, of uh, uh, smart city, the point of failure of smart city, but especially the great opportunity that uh, 
looking at uh, human beings uh, as a uh, uh, meaning maker and uh, the technology and urban space and this complex relationship can uh, can give uh, uh, at a theoretical level but also at a practical level of uh, um, uh, developing new smart city projects. Uh, so some question, but these are only instead of my conclusion, but there can be many others. Uh, uh, it's important to for me, and I hope we can start to do it in the discussion to understand how smart city initiative can be designed to reflect and denounce the cultural identity and values of the community they serve. In what ways technology can be tailored to meet the specific needs and preferences of diverse population within a city, rather than imposing a one-size-fits-all solution, a technology uh, size-fits-all solution, and so on and so forth. Are there any other success stories? Because I'm looking at a specific cultural context in Italy, Northern Italy, Bologna, and the smart projects that are done basically indeed in Northern Italy. Uh, and how can semiotic can extend its influence beyond the cultural aspects? And this is another issue, right? Because when we speak about smart uh, city project and the built environment in general, we speak about something broader than what usually semioticians are maybe used to look at, right? Uh, so um, how can we somehow contribute to design and uh, to better design, uh, you know, smart grids, sustainable transport, energy efficiency process, infrastructure process, and so on, and project, and so on and so forth, which are, uh, you know, projects which uh, where we need uh, a kind of knowledge which is not necessarily traditional uh, within the kind of semiotics. And with this question, uh, I uh, I thank you so much for uh, uh, for the. Uh, for your attention, uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be a uh, important discussion uh, to to try to go towards some uh, some conclusion even even today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Federico Bellentani. And let's start with our panelists in no specific order. Okay, I'm going to call Romani Scheda from the. Universidad Iberoamericana of Mexico, and also director of the Neuro Research Center in Marketing. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Federico. It was very interesting. I've heard you before as well. It was also a very interesting talk. So, well, this is very fascinating. Um, I've worked for a city. We were developing a city here in Mexico. It was kind of, kind of artificial city because in the state of Guanajuato, they have a hub for industrial uh, development. And they wanted to develop a new city there. So we had a chance to do the whole thing <laughs> together, you know? So, and, and it was amazing the way you presented how important people are for these projects. Because if we analyze it historically, there's has, there hasn't been a lot of research on what people need to develop a city. It's, it's more like a kind of organic thing as, as you said, no, you know, we, we live here and we start changing things and things keep changing all, all the time. But it's not that <clears throat> archi uh, architect, uh, urbanistic planners taking into consideration what people really need. So what we try to do is using cognitive semiotics, which is my approach to all of these things, uh, considering, for example, material engagement theory and how we people represent ourselves in material things, you know, and how we grow with material things and how material things change our brains, which is something that you've mentioned somehow. And what we did was interviewing people, the people that were going to be living in this new city, we interviewed them and we tried to analyze their cognitive processing of spaces in their original places where they were born and how they would be motivated to move to a new city because this new city was for, for people who were working in this uh, industrial hub. And it was very fascinating. I mean, the way they, they would try to live their, their, seat, their, their lives in these cities and how they wanted to uh, move from their original places. And that was very, very interesting. But the thing is that it was very complicated to do an engagement with architects 
with urban planners who were already planning the city without taking into consideration any of these people. And I think your, your approach is very, very interesting because you mentioned this need of how can we know people better? And it takes us to, to a semiotic reflection on how can semiotics not only analyze what is already been done, but the cities that are already exist. But how can we approach this from another side? We want to build new cities. We want to help people live a better life. And this, of course, takes us to technologies. It was very, very interesting. I mean, this is most mostly a commentary on my own work, but I think it, it goes very well with what you're saying. And the other very nice thing that you were talking about at the end of your talk was the elderly people. We also work, I, I work in a doctoral degree on in um, um, architecture, um, interior, interior architecture. So we did this very big project for an elderly house. And we interviewed the the people who were living there, the, the uh, care, carekeepers and all of the people involved. And one of the things that was fascinating was discovering how the elderly people that were there felt that they were they had been thrown away. And all their cognitive metaphors that they used were I became an object. So now I am they left me here. They, my my sons took me here and they left me here. So of course they they felt kind of abandoned, but the metaphoric structures were I I became a thing, I'm not a person anymore, I'm a thing. So what we decided was to develop a concept of interior design to make them feel persons again, because their their needs were completely different to what the house could offer. I mean the house was a traditional elderly house with people and they had activities and all uh, of these things. But trying to discover the motivations and the needs of people is a central point. So I think if we can achieve that, and you mentioned that uh, also, if we can achieve a way to approach people and understand their deep needs and their motivations, then technology can be of value for them because technology has to solve these things. And not the other way around, as you said, the, the, we have the technology, we have these big companies trying to sell the technology and to do a very big business. But the same happens with some traditional architects. They do, this is what, the kind of thing that I do. And here's the house for the elderly. So put them in there so, so, and they, they do their best. But it's not very often that they discover the real needs of people in this kind of semiotic uh, level. So. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Thank, Thank you very much. Let's hear now Christian Bankoff from the New Bulgarian University. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Federico. It was very interesting and thought provoking. Um, I would uh, take the a bit. Uh, I would take a bit technocratic position because, in a way. I'm skeptical about the possibility to the possibility of taking the what people want. This is a kind of trap. If you go in, I don't know, in the bars of Bologna and you ask people from Bologna how do you prefer your city to be, you know that this is you will get uh, one hundred thousand contradicting opinions, and you will never be able to. Uh, do any improvement based on the opinions of people. So uh, nowadays, the best example of uh, considering the opinions, the trends of innovation of millions and billions of people involved in a kind of city, those are the social media platforms. So if I could think as a semiotician for a uh, future development of a smart city, definitely I would adopt a lot of, uh, let's say, approaches, algorithms, and way to proceed from the social media platforms as far as they are open and we know what is going on there because there is a lot of stuff which we don't know exactly how it works. 
But um, the fundamental thing to start a smart city is to uh, collect data, to create the premises of uh, collecting in the same way as social media platforms collect every move of ours. And they have a perfect uh, information of our, let's say, life in this kind of virtual cities, which are the platforms. The same should be the first step. Now, what semiotics help in all this uh, for me, it was very um, useful to um, analyze how social media works with the model of the semiosphere, because uh, all about the innovation, this permanent innovation of social media, which makes them all the time very efficient, is that they have a perfect system to collect the trends, there are more active users, the trend makers, people who are on the periphery, but actually they reveal the future trends. So social media are very efficient into uh, understanding what are the, the trends based on statistical models, mostly on statistical models, based, on, and then uh, apply these trends and improve before the, the mass of the users uh, are, um, how to say, um, rejected by the social media so they always innovate in advance and the smart city should be a uh, ever continuously inno innovating city with the soft means not building and destroying you know infrastructure all the time but the organization of the city life should be very much like the organization and this permanent innovation in social media for instance what is the crossing point try to think of uber and airbnb as huge improvements of the efficiency of the resources of the city based on the social media platform model or something very similar to social media platform so uh all my thoughts go in this direction how to grasp the trend how to create the conditions of a smart innovation all the time taking as an example the uh the platforms the way they uh, proceed in this uh, direction and especially adopt the dialectics between periphery and center, which is fundamental to understand how social media works and how probably a city would uh, work. I know in different contexts, Lotman gives a lot of examples of the periphery of the city, of these uh, suburbs and gangs and uh, things. So it is not alien to Lotman's thought, neither to, you know, consider periphery center dialectics as uh, an aspect of the semiosphere, some uh, way the semiospheres exist. So I think those are my um, observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's hear now Hubert Kowaleski from the University of Lublin in Poland. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. I was, uh, while I was listening, I was also thinking about uh, about the city where, where I live in. Uh, it's, it's Lublin. It's like a kind of medium-sized city by, 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 by Polish standards. Uh, and uh, just like Christian said, I have some certain doubts about uh, uh, this approach of asking people because I get the impression that when I talk to my friends about uh, what kind of changes they would like to uh, have in their uh, in in the city, they will have very different ideas. I have many friends who are uh, who love their cars and they would like to have more uh, roads for cars, and they keep complaining that there's not enough parking space for the cars and so on and so forth. But the problem is that if you, if you give more uh, roads to cars and more car parking space, people will be encouraged to use cars, and they will. There will be more cars in the city, and uh, turns out that there's not enough parking lot for this kind of increased number of cars. Anyway, so me as a cyclist, I would like to have fewer cars actually, and I would like to have more cycling routes, for instance. So, uh, one question is that uh, how to navigate, uh, how to navigate through all those uh, uh, through all those uh, conflicting needs of uh, of people. Um, and when I think uh, about how uh, cities were developed uh, in the past, or some some parts of the cities were developed in the past, back in the communist times when there was still a communist regime in Poland, um, well, a communist regime wasn't uh, 
um, uh, even though they 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 claim to be uh, much focusing on the on the common people, uh, they in a sense they weren't. But probably at that time nobody would ask people what they actually wanted or needed in the city. But uh, it turns out that many of the residential areas that were built and designed at that time they were actually quite very very nice i think about these residential areas that were built in 1970s and the 19 the 1980s there were uh lots of you know buildings but there was a lot of, of green area there was there was a lot of art and they were spaced out these buildings are not very overwhelming and even if you visit them now quite uh people quite often say i'm i like i like being there i like going there it's not even about living there but just uh spending spending time there now, on the other hand, when you think about these, uh, the way, uh, the way residential areas, at least in in Dublin uh, here, are built, uh, they are more, um, and they respond to this more like economic uh, pressure rather than what people actually need. And there's the, the just you know huge buildings which are very close together. These are very kind of uh, formidable spaces, not 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 a space that you would like to that you would like to uh be in so uh i think that um uh but many people still would buy houses there because you know that's uh that, that's that, that that's where the, the houses uh are and where they are available so i think that uh to some extent we should uh maybe think about uh, not necessarily what people want by this kind of uh, asking them, them directly. You should take them into consideration uh, to some extent. But then again, my guess is that uh, that regular people, including myself, we don't really see the full picture. I mean, I would like to have well, more cycling routes, but uh, probably we also need uh, some kind of urban planners who can see the whole picture. What would uh, how we could respond to these 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 particular demands of of uh of different of different um on different people so um i think that in 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 lublin which is getting more and more smarter especially as far as public transport is concerned i think the the most positive changes were actually introduced by the city authorities rather than uh rather than the companies we have very nice uh network of uh, of buses of public transport and it's all digitalized and you can uh have this uh you can you can track your bus online on the internet to see where it's going in, in what what uh how long will it take uh to to get to your bus stop that that's actually very convenient but this was something that was done by uh it was commissioned by the by the city authorities so um uh talking about this approach that we start with with technology and only then we think about people uh, yes, I think this is a problem. Engineers uh, quite often have this idea is, okay, I can do that, I can do that, this is technologically possible, we can implement that kind of solution, and then we, but then you ask the common person and you say, okay, well, I don't really, I don't really need that, I don't really need this development. So I think it should start with, I, I definitely agree that it should start with the needs of of the people, of the of the residents in the in the city, but you should also have Maybe someone who kind of navigates through these different conflicting needs and who sees the full picture and uh, uh, is able to 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 design a city uh, that is going to be um, uh, friendly and um, and accessible and uh, and nice to live uh, in for uh, um, a great number of people. So. Um, thank you. I think that's that's it. This, this is just uh, 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 some uh, personal opinions uh, about thinking when I thinking about uh, the city I live in. But hopefully, it's going to be uh, it's going to be useful to some extent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear now Kenneth Foot from the Department of Geography of the University of Connecticut. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Federico for a very interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to learning more or reading more about your research on these issues and the, the issues that you've raised in this talk. I am a geographer and I work in the area of geospatial technologies, technologies that are at the heart of many of the developments of this smart, sense, smart city sensor arrays 
spatial pattern analysis and what's becoming called GeoAI or geospatial artificial intelligence. But my work is also in semiotics of the built environment. So what you've spoken of today is very interesting to me. There are two issues that I'm interested in, in hearing a bit more about now or in the future. I particularly appreciate what you said about using this idea of the smart cities as a way of improving the quality of life for citizens. I think that smart cities may be very important as trying to improve the legibility of cities, to improve design, to create urban spaces that are more enjoyable for living and working and are easier to navigate. I raise this because I was thinking here that this is an opportunity to actually improve the legibility or the semiotic qualities of the urban environment. Some of my work involves looking at memorial spaces, public spaces in cities. Sometimes we take the photographs that people post online or look at social media to see what people say and do in public spaces. And it's interesting because in fact, there's quite a bit of divergence between what the architects and designers intend for public spaces and what the users do. In some cases, of course, they're using it because they want to see things from a particular angle or visit things in a, in a certain order. But it's also clear that in many cases in large cities like New York or Boston in the United States or London and Paris or Budapest, that people are kind of confused by the, the urban environment. They are, they're not very legible. And, and maybe in some cases that's on purpose, but in a sense, these, these smart cities could actually improve the semiotic qualities, the legibility of the cities itself, particularly in public spaces in areas that are used by large numbers of people. But the other, the other issue that I'd raise is one of, of ethics, and it's one that I raise whenever I teach these topics of using geospatial technologies, because I'm really concerned about how this data that we're collecting can be misused, and, and who has access and who doesn't, and how easily it can be manipulated. Now we have these AI models, these large language databases, and, and we're using this with spatial data. So people can pick out patterns very quickly and so I, I think in the long run, I'm, I, I see the advantages of moving in this direction and really appreciate the way that you're thinking creatively about the applications of the, the smart city idea. But I also have deep reservations about some of the ethical issues involved. And I think that those may grow in the future. And I, I hope that we can address them along the way as we develop the technologies. So thank you again, very interesting talk. And I'm looking forward to reading more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let's hear Claudio Gary from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you, Monica. Anyway, I am Guerri. I am still Italian, <laughs> and my name is Guerri. Uh, thank you, Federico, for the nice speech, and uh, I admire the the research you have done on smart city, but I am not a urban, uh, an urbanist or neither an architect probably, but I work on semiotics and uh, from a Persian point of view. And I think that we should use this uh, approach for uh, urban space for architecture, for design in general, because the triadic relation shows how, how it works and how to think about that. I, I have taken some notes about what was saying and what was said, and uh, I, I am worried about the list, the accumulation of data which is uh, very important, of course, is uh, necessary and uh, we cannot go without. But what is the relation between those data? How we can uh, take them? How we can use them? What is the, the semiotic criteria to use them, to understand them? So I cannot say too much in, in details, but um, my point of view is related to, to, to this uh, semiotic problem. I, I don't see 
too much semiotics in those approaches that are mostly in our field, in, in architecture, in, in urban, related to facts. But what can we do with those facts? What, how can semiotics help to, to work on these facts and use them for designing, for thinking over what's going on with a smart city? That's, that's all, I, I, I don't have too much to say, but I admire your work uh, because it is an enormous approach of uh, very complex uh, items. Thank you. Thank you. Roxy. Thank you. Our last speaker will be Dragos Gorgi, but I think he disappeared from our screen. Oh, there. No, no. Uh, oh, there, uh, there. Uh, yeah. Fine. <laughs> but, uh, as I oh. said at the beginning, I was just an observer and uh, not a participant. But if you would like to, to see my opinion uh, as an architect, uh, I see um, a first step to introduce a uh, smart city would be to introduce it in a, a historical uh, uh, city. For instance, for instance, Venice, how uh, the smart uh, technologies could help uh, a city like Venice to, to survive by changing the meaning of the spaces, of the places, by uh, okay, changing the relationship between people. Um, a, a question is, what kind of culture we would like to 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 have in the near future? Uh, a high technology culture, which is a sort of uh, how to say uh, Saint Elia, Saint Elia uh, buildings in the twenties, or uh, um, a culture that will respect the past and uh, will uh, work together with the past. So uh, for me, I think that uh, the smart technologies could be uh, related to the cultural values of the uh, uh, identities of, 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 of the places. I think that the role of uh, anthropologists would be to be the intermediaries, uh, the a sort of uh, uh, interface between the communities and the, the creators, the architects and designers. Uh, the speakers to today uh, uh, okay, mentioned this uh, uh, malfunction between the community and the people who design for the community. So I think that uh, uh, I, anthropologists would uh, fill this gap and to translate to the archaeology to, to the uh, architects and the designers the needs of our communities and also the values the cultural values of the local past well I, I uh, enjoyed the uh, uh, the lecture today because uh, it is very uh, uh, important and contemporary and uh, need to to meditate on on uh, this subject thank you thank you and thank all the panelists now let's return to our speaker Belentani. thank you thank you very much to all i'm uh, really grateful for uh, all your comments i think that uh, smart semiotics uh, webinar series really managed to to put a uh, uh, very important and diverse uh, point of view uh, on uh, on this topic, uh, from the digital to the cognitive to the material culture to the geography uh, to interpretative semiotics and architecture uh, to visual representation and so on. So this is uh, for me very important and very important to see. Uh, you know, uh, great uh, professor and scholars that. Uh, really help uh, my my research since uh, since long time but beside uh, uh, beside this let's go to uh, try to provide uh, uh, 
um, a bit of contribution on uh, on your uh, your questions. Um, thank you very much to Professor Escheda for uh, taking an example. Um, I think I I could have put also more example in my presentation. Uh, interesting also to see, you know, the idea of making a new city. You know that uh, you know we do uh, like the, there are several projects that uh, uh, you know to do a smart city means uh, to starting from scratch, right? To another city somewhere else where there is no other city and so on. So that's already interesting to uh, uh, to to think. And really looking forward to look more closely to the cognitive approach uh, and how uh, material thing, uh, uh, you know, change our brain. That's uh, something that you say that is really, really fascinating. Uh, and, uh, and and also uh, you speak about uh, interviews, you know, interviews. And this is, I will also tell a little bit more later, probably with the suggestion uh, by uh, Christian Bank or the Uber Kowaleski that uh, um, may be for sure one of the method uh, to look at, uh, uh, you know, the famous what people want, but we will, you know, uh, go there a tiny bit later. Uh, very interesting. Uh, um, also, what you say in relation to somehow the resistance of the architect and the urban planner. Now, that's another issue which should have been uh, more highlighted uh, in my in my presentation. So, uh, and also this make me come to say that uh, uh, what I said in the conclusion, uh, they are user too. So, uh, to make them into uh, <laughs> Uh, this more holistic approach means to consider them as citizens and uh, what they do is, uh, uh, you know, the, they will receive the benefit, you know, a smarter city is a city that is uh, uh, where there is the tools uh, for their work to be also easier and simpler and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So in this respect, uh, 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 very, very interesting. On the elderly people, uh, this I, I am Italian. Uh, Italy is the second, third, or uh, older um, country uh, in the world, and this is an issue which, yeah, in the media you hear it, but it's not really taken uh, seriously so far. Uh, we are going to have especially regional uh, government uh, which are going to explode. Uh, probably this will be the first, uh, you know, issue where we, they are going to, to collapse because they don't have any more people, places, tools and so on and so forth to deal with the massive uh, older population. Uh, with the project Massimo Leone, we are uh, providing uh, um, a first theoretical contribution and an actual practical contribution because there will be an app which make uh, uh, older people be more connected with the families. But this is, you know, just as a, a small piece of it at the cultural level, I understand that. Uh, that would be a, a, an issue. If we did, do not integrate uh, elderly people in urban planning, uh, city government policies, and in general, and the uh, smart uh, city project in particular is going to be a great issue. And I'm sorry to say, I still don't have uh, a lot of uh, experience on that. Uh, and especially, I don't see much attention on it. And, this is a this is a problem. You you raise your hand. If you want to? Yes, I just wanted to point out something very important. When we interview people, we don't ask them what they want. You don't do that. Yes. You yes. want to do that, of course. What we do, we try to um, go to their personal, uh, biogra autobiographical experiences, and through those autobiographical experiences, where they use images and photographs and things like that. We discover, for example, their image schematic structures. And that, that avoids all this what they want thing, you know? Because when you go into the depth of image schematic structures, the way they leave spaces, you start to find regularities that are very, very interesting. Like 
Professor Claudio where is it? And uh, Kenneth Hood, you know, when you see all this big data, just as they appear uh, literally in social media, for example, when you go into the depth of the image schematic structures they are, that are showing up there, you find very, very interesting things. And I, I would say what Christian said, because we use that approach too. If you go to social media and you start discovering all these qualitative in-depth structures, you have you also have the quantitative data there. So you have a huge amount of qualitative data translated into in-depth discoveries, which are already quantified. And then you start finding some very interesting scientific uh, discoveries on what to do with these people and how to build for them. So I just wanted to point out that. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Uh, exactly. You did well because now I'm coming to the what people want uh, issue. And I am really grateful to, to, to Christian Markov and Hubert Kowalewski to, to raise the, the issue. I should have put more in my presentation regarding that, uh, even if I don't have uh, already a multi-method approach that can uh, somehow solve this issue. And uh, probably this uh, idea uh, that uh, what people want, uh, a bit naive like that, came also from my uh, uh, peculiar use of the English language. Uh, um, but I wanted to to clarify this uh, this with you. I definitely agree on uh, that we would never be able to grasp uh, all the, the, the multifaceted uh, uh, opinions, point of views, uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh from this to not taking even uh, you know uh, to, to 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 make an effort there's definitely a, a a middle way uh we need and uh and and, and let's throw the the challenge you know uh, um, christian maybe in your journal we can uh, try to uh to make a paper out of it uh, to create a multi-method uh, approach to uh, to look at the opinion and, and the identity value of urban spaces because i think that uh, on a mix between uh, as you said sentiment analysis on social media opinion mining qualitative and quantitative as well as semi-structured interview as for example professor Esqueda said uh, so not uh, asking what people want, but uh, uh, through an actual uh, semiotic approach that can help with that. As well as on the pragmatic level, what people do. So do a lot of observation during summer, uh, um, uh, winter, uh, day, night, uh, weekdays, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, this multi-method approach, then we will have, uh, in Italy we say a, a hand help the other, right? So you will have... Uh, uh, the, the opinions, which uh, are definitely somehow biased from the people, but then you can uh, confront them with the observation data, but then you can confront them with the uh, sentiment analysis and opinion mining from uh, social media and so on. So, well, this, it's already something that the public administration can use in order not to do smart projects, uh, smart city projects out of scratch. So that's what was the main critics. Because what I see is that, you know, sometimes the process is that simple. Hello, we have the budget. Let's make a smart city project. Generative AI, cool, let's go on like this, like, you know, a little bit out of nowhere. So, uh, and, and to use more sproutly, more, uh, strategically also social media for example for example mm -hmm. the moment uh, you know public administration of bologna since you you notice uh, they really look a lot on the vanity metrics right on the likes uh, that they make your take and so on and so forth there is a little bit less uh, time uh, uh, resources and so on and so forth to look at those data that you were referring uh, at um Hubert, thank you once again to uh, bring in the the issue uh, and to bring the uh, example of uh, of Lublin uh, um, using what data 
you you asked, uh, which also refer to the issue of uh, Claudio Guerri, which we will discuss in a, um, in a, in a minute. And that what you also said, uh, uh, the, the conflicting views you also raised the problem of the conflicting views of uh, uh, of the different urban communities this is something that i think as semiotician can really uh, provide a contribution to public administration uh, we know that there is a, <laughs> a multifaceted uh, interpretation meaning making that they change over time they change over culture they change uh, through according to the uh, education and other criteria of people and they change uh, through time or they change for contingent needs so absolutely uh, and semiotic can really help to grasp this uh, complexity uh, navigate the conflict so uh, semiotic urban planning can help to navigate this conflict and and also uh, you know my especially when uh, in, when we look at uh, uh, controversial monuments and memorials uh, and so on and so forth, my idea is never to avoid that conflict or to silence that conflict. I think this is not uh, useful. Of course, we need to secure the area <laughs> in order not to people to to have a, you know um, to. to to have a huge issue but uh, on the other hand uh, uh, it's important to analyze that conflict and to provide a solution that uh, uh, also use that conflict to create a new kind of meaning uh, to, uh, to to grasp how to do that we know that there is you know a, a, a one uh, uh, standard solution uh, we know that it changes from culture to culture. We know that sometimes it's not possible to do anything and so on and so forth. Well, if around the monuments, like controversial monuments, uh, we put very, you know, uh, very easy, fast, and uh, relatively cheap, you know, some uh, researcher in history, in anthropology, in semiotics, and so on and so forth, to look at what that conflict actually is in that specific time uh then we can we i mean the public administration can understand the origin of that conflict uh, and we'll have a little bit more tools in order to avoid the huge issues so that's uh, uh what's your comment make me make me think and you know uh a semiotic urban planning to navigate the conflict uh, i think we can uh, work on that somehow um uh, in the future uh Professor Kenfu, thank you very much for uh, uh, bringing some example also of uh, the technology to use. Uh, your your work on connecting uh, geography and semiotics uh, was of great uh, uh, inspiration for me, as well as on uh, uh, the, the looking at uh, built forms as such as monuments and memorial, as, uh, as you know. Um, uh, regarding the two is issues you raised, uh, uh, I would like to focus on uh, on uh, on the second one, which was uh, a lack in my presentation today due to time and everything, uh, uh, is the technology misuse. We really need to <laughs> uh, to look at it, and uh, I think that uh, mm, uh, I think that uh, uh, the digital humanities. Uh, really have uh, today um, th they must can and can uh, look at uh, uh, the ethical issues uh, that uh, technological measures can uh, can have from the use of chat GTP in doing uh, documents of urban planning uh, till the algorithm using geospatial technology uh, that advance a certain urban community rather than others uh, and so on and so forth so uh, really looking forward to look at this uh, issue more closely and uh, and uh, uh, and hopefully to write something about it soon uh professor claudio guerri um, thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, this comment uh, it, this is a, a crucial point and uh, a, a point that i know that i still have to do a lot of work on it um 
what we can do with those data, how and why semiotics can look at those data, because at the moment, semioticians are used only solely to do a better data visualization and to do a better storytelling out of data. I think we can do a little bit more than that. So uh, I'm sure that using a person point of view and a specific semiotic one, we can improve to do that. I need time to do that. I need uh, more research to do that, but uh, it's definitely a point that you raised that uh, uh, I mean, we need, uh, as a community, I would say, to to look at it and uh, and me as, as a person, as a researcher, to, uh, to do it. So this question, I will place it to uh, at, at the top of my uh, aims. Uh, last but not least, uh, um, Professor Georgiou, um, the idea, uh, the fantastic idea of looking at the smart city project into the historical city. Uh, and uh, how can we save Venice? I think we can do you know, a, a series of webinars which may somehow go viral with a little bit uh, of digital advertisement. But beside that, beside jokes, um, I think that you raised the point on uh, the um, uh, to to look at more closely, and I think as a mathematician we can add to that on how smart technology can relate uh, to identity of places, to uh, the, the the past that those places express, uh, to the material culture that uh, uh, those uh, uh, places express, and so on and so forth. Um, we need to do that because we are start to call the technology and also some trends uh, in uh, in uh, in the disciplines as well as in technology design as transhuman. Um, I understand we live uh, in a transhuman world where uh, uh, technology and humans uh, cognition are more merged and so on and so forth. I'm not uh, against that uh, uh, by uh, but let's say just like that, right? Absolutely. But on the other hand, when we do design a smart uh, um, city project, uh, uh, focus solely on the technology in, in order to be transhuman, I think that then we have an issue, right? The problem of Venice are way more uh, are huge because <laughs> there's a, uh, a very practical uh, issue that... Uh, uh, related to its conformation that I don't have enough experience uh, to, to deal with that. But uh, how to make uh, smart technology to be more related to the identity uh, of the places, uh, um, I think is, uh, is important. All, 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 all this, um, all, all this comes to, mm, especially this last, uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, I think that to, to summarize somehow, uh, to look at this approach, to look at this uh, issue, I think that we definitely need to look at the urban text, you know, its past, its material culture. It's... Then, of course, there is uh, something outside the text. Uh, and, and here, of course, I, I look also at uh, 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 at the geographers and the cultural geographer that uh, already uh, know very well this path of you know from landscape as text to something more than uh, uh, something beyond the text, and we definitely need to look at the pragmatical um, issues or at the at the practice uh, that people do. And in this respect, uh, we need to go even beyond. So we need to look at how technology is designed and how the city is designed and to have a deep thought about it as a musician, uh, because the way technology and city is designed uh, can really influence how we live in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a very near future. So that's a very small conclusion uh, and uh, extra thinking that comes from uh, uh, your kind uh, and very interesting uh, comments. So thank you very much for that. That's the question. Hello. Yes. 
can can you hear me? Yes. Ah, oh, thank thank you, <laughs> Federico. Thank you very much. Uh, as a principal, I never intervene in the webinars, and I just enjoy being uh, a uh, auditor and uh, make a lot of uh, uh, pleasure out of it. But with the permission of the moderator, I will make two remarks. Please. Thank you. Um, in general, I found that the missing the, or the blind spot in the semiotical space is called time. You cannot deal with space without time. Distance is as much spatial as temporal. Uh, surface is as much temporal as spatial. Now, I would like to insert, to call your attention to two very interesting and very relevant um, items connecting to the topic of the webinar. One is called 15 minutes cities. 15 minute cities, huh? 15 minute cities. And it is a concept which is already applied, which has been developed mostly by sociologists. And the, right now, the, there was recently an article in Le Monde, the mayor of Paris is seriously studying that. So what is interesting about it is that it is something which can be applied to existing cities by reforming something or which can be taken into consideration when you plan new cities. And the 15 minute cities means that every citizen is at a maximum of 15 minutes by walking or by bicycle ride from all the places where they have to go to run their life. That is, they cannot be more than 15 minutes away from a pharmacy, not that 15 minutes away from their place of work, not that 15 away from their favorite bars, and so on and so on and so on. Now, it does not mean that the city is a, an accumulation of cells separated, because all these neighborhoods can, of course, overlap. But it is a general principle, and of course, you can get an algorithm to make sure when you have a, built a new city that you have the 15 minute cities. So please Google 15 minute cities and you will find very, very interesting material. My second remarks is more about the inner, inside space. And it is called the BA theory, BA, BA theory. And it, is, it has been developed by Japanese. And it is a notion of space, how space is conducive to uh, not only well-being, it's, di it's somewhat different from Feng Shui, the Chinese thing, no. It is something which is more different and which is quite different. And it is the fact that some space are such that they favorize or nur nurture, nurture uh, creativity and, and well-being. So two things, please Google 15 minute cities and ba theory. And you, you will find very interesting material, very relevant to what uh, Federico has, has discussed now. And I think that it answers some of the questions, practical questions. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. I, I'm so happy to see all of you and to see that there is so much interaction. And I apologize for having taken so much time. But I think that 15 minute cities and bath theory are two important things. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Is there any other comment or if question? I just, uh, if I can just comment one second, uh, very briefly to, to Paul, thanking him a lot for uh, for this uh, opportunity to have uh, so many different points of views uh, in, uh, in this panel. I'm sorry also, Laura was not uh, with us. There will be also the marketing uh, point of view and uh, would help to make this panel a little bit more uh, less uh, we're only guys here today so we need to uh, figure it out how to um, uh, solve these issues as well uh, regarding the um, 50 minute city I'm coming from a 30 minute city since it's Bologna so the mayor say it's 30 minute city it's not 50 minute city otherwise it would be an issue right and uh, is uh, this policy was implemented uh, uh, simultaneously with the uh, 30 kilometer per hour city okay so at the moment uh, all over Bologna uh, you can go only of 30 kilometers per hour uh, with your, your car 
So the idea is uh, to make impossible for the people to use the car uh, in order to use uh, alternatives, right? Problem, there are no alternatives. <laughs> so uh, I definitely uh, will look at this uh, 15 I mean, of city, I know the, the concept uh, is amazing, but I think that uh, you raise a point which is consistent of uh, what I was saying before. Uh, this is a trend that uh, the mayor of Bologna, mm, for sure, with his own ideas, uh, and uh, I'm sure that th there are way, uh, space and time uh, to uh, to develop uh, the issue, but at the moment is uh, is not working, right? At the moment, uh, this is not a city of the 30 minutes because of the, the, for me to reach the, the hospital, to reach the airport, to reach the train station, it's not 30 minutes. Yeah, but right? this applies to walking or bicycle, not cars. Exactly, exactly. At the moment, uh, it's not like that. <laughs> so uh, we need to understand uh, how to do it. If it's public transport, then we have a problem of traffic and we need to address that. So... At the moment, this was used uh, the 30 because uh, it was simultaneous, the, the city of the 30 uh, minutes and the city of the 30 kilometers per hour. At the moment, there have been the slogan, a little bit of you know greenwashing if you want, to make uh, a set of policy, which I hope, I, I'm pretty, I mean, I'm a fan of the mayor and not against it, I hope, that will be, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the the Bologna of the future will have this issue. I, I really can help uh, leaving my car at home to walk and to cycle if there will be, you know, the opportunity to act to be a 30 uh, minutes of the main uh, thing that you said. Still, it's a very workable city. Still, is a, you know, uh, there are also many positive aspects. Uh, but I think you raise exactly the uh, the point that uh, those are amazing policies and amazing projects. Uh, uh, but if we do deal, uh, we study it, uh, taking a a paper from uh, uh, another place uh, where this works, but maybe it's not applied to Bologna. And using algorithms from uh, from Google, maybe that doesn't mm. work, right? Mm. So that's my, my main issue. Uh, hopefully, we'll work in the future. Thank you. Thanks to okay. you. Okay, before we close, I would like to make a comment. Your your talk made me think of an issue that is going happening right now in Brazil. We had a huge flood in the south of the country, frontier with Uruguay. It's a state with 12 million inhabitants and as big almost as Texas. And the, the river rose five me uh, meters and the lake rose the same proportion. So many cities were not only destroyed, but they were erased from the map. And um, so now they have not only to rebuild, they have to relocate these people. And if you speak about inhabitants, you know, you had their colonization by Germans, by Polish, by Italians, not to speak of other cultures. So your model would be an appropriate model for the whole state, not only for a small city. So it just made me think, you know, how, how many issues are involved? And I think your project is a lifelong project. So I would like to thank you very much, thank Federico Belentani, for your intervention. I want to thank, thank all the panelists. I want to thank Paul Buissac for putting this together as always. Thank and you. I want also to, to thank our technological support by Zig. And so yeah. if there's no, are no more any comments, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much to all. Thank Bye. you. Bye.